This episode of Smart Poker Study is brought to you by my upcoming hand reading webinar. It's going to be held on October 22nd at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Accurate hand reading allows you to make better, more positive EV choices in every hand you play. Not only is it great at the tables, but hand reading allows for better off the felt hand analysis. The webinar comes with additional items and some bonuses, so don't miss out. Attend the webinar and become a rock star hand reader. Visit www.smartpokerstudy.com slash hand reading webinar for more info and to purchase now. Hello, I'm Sky Matsuhashi, founder of SmartPokerStudy.com, the place for poker players who are always striving to be better today than they were yesterday. Poker People, in episode 99, I dove deeper into blind stealing with some positional analysis, stealing ranges, dealing with limpers, bet sizing, and break-even math. Hey, poker people. Thanks for listening. Uh, Thanks for subscribing in iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. Thanks also for subscribing in YouTube and for being a Weekly Boost subscriber. You guys are subscribing every way possible. It's so much support, and I appreciate all of it. And today, hey, look out the window. It's a lovely Friday here in Fresno, California. And you know what that means. Q&A time, baby. Let's roll. Today I'm featuring three questions from some gorgeous poker peeps, and I really do mean gorgeous. They sent me some screenshots or headshots along with their emails, and woohoo, Nelly, beautiful people today. So please visit the show notes at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod100 for links to everything I discussed today and to join the weekly boost for exclusive poker strategy delivered directly to your inbox every single week. And now for our feature presentation. So the first question today comes from Javier. We chatted a little bit via email back and forth, but his question boiled down to this. By the way, a random question. What do you recommend for mastering 6 max cash games? Well, thanks for the question, Javier. For mastering 6 max cash games, there are probably a hundred things you need to learn. But I think there's one topic that, assuming you've got some necessary strategy under your belt, like opening and 3-bet ranges, uh, or and of course the importance of position and playing in the blinds, once you've got that stuff kind of under your belt, you've really got to work on understanding your opponents and their 6 max aggression. A lot of them overuse aggression because they say things like, hey, it's 6 max, I gotta be aggressive. When most of your opponents are going one way, you've got to go the other way to profit from their mistaken frequencies. If you try to fight fire with fire and out-aggress them, you're going to have a super bumpy ride. And it's just like playing very aggressive when you're at a super nitty or taggy table. Doing the opposite of your opponents leads to exploiting their weaknesses. So... Thinking about your 6-max aggression and your opponents, they tend to get overly aggressive pre-flop, so they get to the flop in bloated pots with weaker ranges. You need to be a little less aggressive, play against them in position, and do more calling. If you get 3-bet, you can call more often with a wider range, because they are probably 3-betting with weaker ranges. Because they're so aggressive, you'll need to do more calling post-flop as well, and don't let them blow you off of pots when you have showdown value. Alrighty, good luck fighting those laggy 6 Max players, Javier. So question two today comes from Kedarin. Hi, Sky. About ace king off, ace queen, and pocket jacks. Is it okay to cold call if someone has already called the initial razor before me and go to the flop multi-way? I'm still on podcast number 35 for now, but catching up as I'm working on my game concurrently. Regards, Kedarin. Well, cool beans. Thanks for that, uh, for that email and question, Kedarin. And it's absolutely okay to cold call with pocket jacks and ace queen Uh, or better. And actually, when you're the second caller, we just call that overcalling. So it's okay to overcall, but that's not to say that it's the optimal play or that it's not optimal either. You know, it's it's all situational and uh, it's dependent on the players you're up against. When you're facing a raise and a call, you need to consider the opponents that, that made the raise and the call. You need to consider your position and the cards that you're dealt. Remember also that you've got three choices. When you're facing a raise, you can either fold, call, or re-raise. And you want to choose the play that's most positive EV. 
So let's think about this, you know, when is it okay to make the overcall? And here are three times when it's okay. When the original raiser or the first caller is on a super tight range because of their stats or the player type or the history that you have with them, you could just put them on a very strong range. And you know that your ace queen are better and your pocket jacks probably aren't ahead right now. So don't bloat the pot with a worse hand. You don't want to make that three bet with jacks when you know your opponents have queens or better. And if your opponent are likely to call your three bet to see the flop, then you might want to keep the pot small and just make the call. This could be good when you're playing out of position in the blinds, for example. And the last time when it's probably okay to overcall is when your ace king or ace queen is suited, um, or when the implied odds are big enough to go set mining with those pocket jacks. So of course, when is it okay to 3-bet squeeze instead of overcalling? So if your 3-bet will get them to lay down most hands, and you can win that 7.5 big blind pot right then, it's probably better uh, to make the 3-bet than to just call. And if your 3-bet will get 1 to fold and 1 to call, that's a good idea as well so that you see the flop heads up. You also want to think about how your opponents approach post-flop play. If they're fit or fold or honest on one street, then you might be able to take advantage of that. So building the pot pre-flop could be good because it's more chips for you to take away from them later uh, post-flop, especially if you've got position on them. The last question you might ask yourself is when is it okay to fold with that ace-queen or better in pocket jacks? And... You know, one time when it's okay to fold is probably when you know that your hand is a dog and you're facing a very strong range. Let's say you're in a tournament, everyone has 20 big blind stacks. Well, that's that might not be enough implied odds to make that call with pocket jacks or ace queen or ace king because you're probably dominated and it's very unlikely you'll be hitting a set. Also, the more players you have yet to act after you, uh, that could be cause for concern. If some of them are super aggressive and maybe they can three bet squeeze you out of the pot. That might be a reason to fold. Uh, or, of course, you could take that three-bet line to be more aggressive and, and take that three-betting play away from them. Sure, they can still four-bet bluff you, you know, or, or yeah, four-bet with a weaker hand. But most players make light three-bets, and they don't make light four-bets that often. Alrighty, so in general, it is okay to overcall, but think about your situation, think about the position you're in, and think about what raising could actually give you as opposed to calling. Alrighty, thanks for that question, Kadarin. Big news, everybody! We've got our first sponsor. It's Habwin.com, baby! Habwin, H A B W I N.com. Do you like online poker? What if you could win prizes at zero cost? With Habwin, you can play free, exclusive $100 free rolls on Party Poker and BWIN. Check out our October Poker Fest every Sunday at 8 p.m. Central European Time. Jump at the opportunity to win extra cash completely for free. Register now at www.habwin.com and click on the October Poker Fest banner to start the fun. That's www.habwin.com. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, my hand reading webinar is coming up soon on October 22nd at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I got lots of great feedback after that last one that I did on rejamming in MTTs, so it's time to do another. The all-important skill of hand reading is going to be covered in full detail, in full glory, during this one and a half hour webinar. It's the number one requested skill from all the listeners, so it is about time that I hit this hard and heavy and I gave you the help that you're looking for. Accurate hand reading allows you to extract maximum value when you've got your opponent crushed. It helps you bluff your opponents off of their showdown-worthy hands, and it helps you to get away from those hopeless situations. And of course, as a bonus, everyone who signs up gets a special hand reading podcast and a training video to boot. These three items, the webinar, podcast, along with the training video, together they will make you a rock star hand reader. And if you can't attend the webinar, hey, no worries. You'll receive a copy of the webinar for you to watch during your next study session. So visit www.smartpokerstudy.com slash handreadingwebinar for more info and to purchase today. Seating is limited, so don't miss out. And let me take a quick moment to give DG a quick shout out for purchasing my smart HUD for Poker Tracker 4. You're the man, DG, and I'm sure the smart HUD will help you crush your opponents starting with your very next session. If you'd like to check out the smart HUD for yourself, head on over to www.smartpokerstudy.com slash smart HUD to check it out and to buy now, baby. 
Cool beans. It's time for question three from Arthur. And, you know, it's just funny. Every time I hear the name Arthur, I think of King Arthur from The Sword in the Stone. And if you haven't seen The Sword in the Stone, great cartoon released back in the 60s. But, um, you know, King Arthur in that story, he was actually like a little kid, a little blonde kid, scrawny little kid named Wart, and he pulled the sword out of the stone. But it's funny, I guess maybe I watched that movie at a at a pivotal time in my childhood. So every time I hear Arthur, I think King Arthur and Wart from The Sword in the Stone. Uh, just a little bit about me. Now you know me a little bit more. Let's get to Arthur's question. So his question, very simple. How about strategy for bankroll challenges? Thanks, Arthur. Okay, thanks for that question, Arthur. I appreciate it. So for giving yourself a bankroll challenge, you first need to figure out your goal. Let's say your role is at, maybe it's at $1,000 and you want to double that. Great, you want to earn $1,000. The next step is figuring out your time frame. And let's say you want to do this within a month. Okay, sounds doable. One month to earn 1K. Nice and simple. I like it. Now you need to figure out how much money you currently make per hand or even per hour or per tournament right now. And this is your win rate or your ROI, return on investment, some people call it. Divide your goal by that win rate and that will tell you how many hands or hours or tournaments you need to play at your current win rate to hit your goal. So let's say you're an MTT player. So far, your win rate or ROI this year, maybe it's an average of $1.50 for each MTT played. So to make $1,000, you can expect to have to play $1,000 divided by the $1.50 per MTT or 667 MTTs to get that $1,000 profit. To do this in one month's time, you'll have to play about 20 MTTs per day with no day off at all. And let's say that you currently average maybe only eight MTTs per day, uh, you know, in a, in a given month. Well, how the heck will you suddenly find the time or motivation to play 20 when you're only doing eight right now? It seems undoable, but what if you extended your challenge to buy a month? So let's say you give yourself two months or 60 days to play 667 MTTs. That's a much more realistic 11 MTTs per day. Great. So I think this is a good and challenging goal. You've been playing eight MTTs per day. So you'll push yourself to play 11 per day for two months to hit that 1K goal. Nice, I'm down with that. So other than figuring out how many games or hands or hours you have to play, the other part of this should be to find ways to make more money from your time on the felt. If you can increase your ROI from $1.50 to $1.75 per game, then over the course of that 667 MTTs, you'll earn $1,167 instead of the 1K. Or you can look at it another way, you'll hit your 1K goal in 52 days as opposed to the 60 days. So Great, you say. How can we earn more, Sky? Well, I have a few ways that you can earn more. The first one is strive to play your A game every single session and to not skip any days, or else you'll have to play more to make up for skipped days. And if you're playing more, you might not be as fresh and might not be playing that A game. So um, don't skip days and strive to play that A game. The next way that we can earn more is you got to work on finding profitable tables or tournaments or sites or card rooms or even hours of the day to play at whatever site you're at. Maybe, you know, maybe the weaker players play at night as opposed to the afternoons, or maybe they play in the mornings as opposed to the nights, or maybe they play in the early hours, like 1 a.m. to 4 p.m. because everyone's sleepy, but they keep playing. Maybe that's the time to change up your hours to play more, to earn more. Uh, the next way that you can earn more money is you want to stay sane by taking breaks when necessary while you're pushing yourself to play a lot of poker. Currently, you've been playing 8 MTTs. Now you're pushing yourself to play 11. That is a big increase, and your mental game could suffer because of that. So keep your mental game in check. Take breaks. Stay sane. The next way we can earn more money is study more, of course. You can improve your areas of your game that need improving and then fix those ugly leaks that you've got. And the last way that we can earn more is you want to analyze your regular opponents so you either lose less to them or start earning more from them. Alrighty, thanks for that question, Arthur, and let me know what challenge you set for yourself, and good luck, buddy. Thank you so much for listening, and thanks again to Javier, Kadarin, and Arthur for the questions featured today. I hope that my answers boost your poker skills. If you're not already there, head over to the show notes page for everything discussed today at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 100. And I love feedback. Send it in through the show notes, or you can email me at sky at smartpokerstudy.com, tweet me at smartpokerstudy, or post in the Facebook group at smartpokerstudy.com slash discuss. 
And if you have questions that you'd like featured on the show, and of course, if you'd like them answered, because I answer every single question that comes in, regardless of it being on the show or not, send it in through any of the channels just mentioned. Alrighty, poker people, I'll be back on Tuesday for another strategy episode. It'll be class four of MED number two, Blind Stealing. It's going to be very informative, so make sure you come back in just a few days to download it. And y'all know that word of mouth is the best advertising, so keep spreading the word. And don't forget to visit www.smartpokerstudy.com slash handreadingwebinar to learn more and to sign up. And of course, I want to thank our show sponsor today, Habwin. Check out their October Poker Fest by visiting www.habwin.com and clicking on that October Poker Fest banner. Register and start your free roll fun, y'all. Head on over and check them out. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet. Oh.